have the email just to follow through. Um, but it's great to be back all here together. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all separated in groups of uh, boys' household, girls' yeah. household, and we had our little sort of five and a little bit more sometimes over at the Tomo. Mm. Um, you know, it may skip over before church and after church. <laughs> Maybe it was time for a change. Uh, but it's good to be here together. I'm excited. I'm excited to be with you guys all here together. You know, I'm excited as well to really think that I think it's time for us to get back on the road and fill the seats up as we are called to be. Right? Um, but it's an interesting week. You know, um, I know that this coming week we're going to have uh, Mother's Day. Right? So I'm just going to remind all of you guys that, you know, this coming week is Mother's Day. So just to prepare yourself, make sure you do something special for your mom. Right? Um, if you don't have your mom here in the country, um, Jenna and I can be your mom, you know, yeah. and uh, we can receive whatever gift that you have on behalf of but, uh, but yeah, you know, just start planning out, make sure you guys are encouraged, and also encourage the moms that are in our church, you know, yeah. you know speaking of uh, love and faith, um, just make sure that, you know, we prepare for that, and just to let you guys know, uh, just because some people might be like, oh, wait, today's Mother's Day, and it's like, yeah, we told you like two weeks ago. Mm. Um, but yeah, this coming week as well for midweek, we will meet together. Uh, the, the location is not yet known, but we'll let you guys know and so yes. forth. There you go. Um, <laughs> we're still trying to find places. <laughs> so the lesson, like I said, has been sent out of our email. But the title of my lesson today is Beware of False Teachers. Mm. Um, who remembers what we were talking about on chapter one, right? So we're going through our second Peter series right now. And uh, for those of you new visiting, what we're doing is we're studying out a certain book. Right? So we know what God is trying to say to us, what He's trying to teach us through mm. the series, uh, and covering chapter by chapter. But who can remember what happened in chapter 1? Perseverance. What? Growth. Growth. Come on, Eric. Wow, growth. Increasing knowledge. <laughs> Increasing knowledge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Perseverance. Oh. Brotherly kindness. Amen. Amen. That was very convincing. Yeah. Yeah. Supporting me. yeah, we talked about you know making <laughs> every effort, right? Um, <laughs> every effort, there you go. Yeah. Right? You know? But um, you know, I think what's even better today is that you know instead of uh, just listening to me behind like what Eric was saying behind the screen and so forth, you guys get to hear it live, right? <laughs> um, but like I said, the title of my lesson is "Beware of False Teachers." Today we're going to be covering Chapter Two of the Second Peter book. So please turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Okay, excuse me, I'm just going to do my clock so I don't run over time and don't stop you guys from having to mind. Mm. Oh. <laughs> okay, awesome. So beware of false teachers, right? So we'll be looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. You know, last week we ended all, it off talking about Peter was saying, you know, you've got to make every effort mm. to confirm your calling to go to heaven. And that really goes against all this idea that we're like, hey, now we're saved, we'll always be saved, right? Mm. Let's just sit back and enjoy and, you know, let's just wait for Jesus to come. Mm. No, the Bible says, no, you've got to make every effort to confirm that calling. Mm. And so Peter goes on and he says, look, the prophets even confirm it through their writings. But here in chapter 2, verse 1, he continues on, and he talks about more prophets this time. But he actually talks about false prophets. And so I've only got two points for you guys today, and that is point number one, false teachers will come, right? Point number two, false teachers will go, bracket to hell, right? Or da, 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 to hell, right? So false teachers will come, and false teachers will go. Mm. Tell them to listen, beware of false teachers. So we'll start off with point number one, uh, verses one to three. So please turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter two, verse one to three. Okay. The Bible says, point number one, false teachers woke up. It says, but there were also false prophets among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. You know, I put in a I put in a little description there of what heresies is. Basically, heresies means false doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. Even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Meaning, you know, it just basically means to bring disgrace in the eyes of the public, right? In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories 
Their condemnation has been uh, has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. We'll stop right there. Mm. You know, right here it says it's talking about the fact that you know false prophets. There were a lot of them in the Old Testament, right? Mm. And Peter goes, he's like, you know, just like there were a lot of false prophets in the Old Testament. In the same way with you guys right now, there are false teachers among you, or there will be false teachers mm. among you. You know, according to the Bible, such people are not new. Right? If you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Oh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says, what has been will be again. Mm. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Mm. You know, the Bible talks about there is nothing new under the sun. So if there were false prophets from the beginning, there will also be false teachers or prophets today. Yep. You know, false teachers being in the kingdom is not a matter of whether they will be in the kingdom. It's a matter of when they will be. Mm. You know, people about it often ask me, they go, well, why does God want false or allow false teachers in his beautiful kingdom? I mean, doesn't he want things to be great and remain great? Well, I think personally, there's two reasons, right? Number one, because God is patient with them and he wants them to repent. Right. right. The reason why God allows false teachers to do things is because he's waiting for them to repent. Because in this life, it's either God makes things happen or he allows things to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Nothing happens outside of God's watch or control. And so false teachers being present is God waiting for them to repent. So if you guys go to 2 Peter chapter 3, just turn over the page. 2 Peter chapter 3, and if you go to verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And it's going on, it says, look, God bringing judgment, destroying the earth, and saving the righteous, sometimes we feel like, man, it's taking far too long, Right? I mean, don't you ever feel like you want to just be saved and take it to heaven? You know what I mean? Mm. I remember when Thomas got sure. baptized, he's like, man, I just want to die, man. <laughs> he's just like, I'm, I'm tired of, I don't, I don't want to struggle with sin and stuff. I just want to be baptized and then go to heaven. Yeah. Right? But sometimes we feel that way, right? We were like, God, why don't you just take us? Yeah. But here, yeah, God is just, God is like, it's, it's not really about you, mm. right? Mm. I'm choosing you to go help others that I'm being patient with to come to repentance. Mm. I think the second reason... Is also because to test us. So if you guys turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 13. The reason why God allows false teachers to be in this kingdom is secondly to test us. Mm. In Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 1 to 3. Deuteronomy. Uh, the Bible says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder... And if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Wow. You know, it's interesting today, right? In today's world, almost everything is about the approval of the majority. Right. Yeah. You know, you, you think about it, in social media, you, you always got to be looking now. It's like, how many views did I get? Right? How many likes did I get? Like, did people watch my TikTok, right? Mm. Did people share my TikTok, right? Um, and you sort of look and it's like, man, how many likes did I get on social media, on Instagram? How many people follow me on Instagram, right? I don't have Instagram, so I, I don't have that sort of illness and so forth. But, it's like, um, <laughs> but I even, um, it's, it's crazy because during the week, I even saw on YouTube, there was this one guy um, who made about over 30,000 US dollars, right? 30,000 US dollars on one video that was 12 minutes long um, <clears throat> that had about 12 million views, right? So from 12 million views, he made 30 grand. Wow. Some of us, that's our yearly pay. <laughs> Some of us, that's like lifetime's pay, you know? Boy. But it was all this idea of making money out of the approval of people. You know, when you think of the keeping up with the Kardashians, Ooh, right? I don't watch the Kardashians, just so you know. But, I, <laughs> yeah. but anyways, um, but it's all about the approval of people, right? 
But God is different. You see, God isn't interested in the amount of followers, the amount of people who like Him, the amount of people that appreciate Him. He's not interested in the amount of followers there are today. He's more interested only in those that love Him with all their hearts and all their soul. Right. Mm. You know, He's trying to, you know, the reason why He allows false prophets in the church or in the country or even in the world, He's like, let me just see who actually is seeking for me with all their heart. You know, are they just going to go for the blessing? Or are they going to just seek me because they want to be with me? Mm. And so that's why He doesn't destroy false prophets. That's, the, that's why He doesn't destroy false teachers. Because if God wanted to, he could just reach out and kill this false teacher, kill that false teacher. But he's like, I just want to see who actually really is seeking right. me with all of their hearts Amen. and all of their souls. You know, when I was uh, in my second year of being a disciple, I went up to John and I complained. I was like, why do we have to do seeking God in the first study? I mean, we just got to tell them that they're not a disciple, they're going to hell. And maybe they'll repent. Right? <laughs> and um, John looked at me and he's like, well, that's because you don't have a conviction on seeking God. Okay. Wow. I was like, what do you mean by that? And he's like, that's what it's all about. Right. Because before anyone wants to become a disciple, they've got to have a heart to seek God with all of their heart. Yeah. And if they don't want to give God all of their hearts, what's the purpose? Right. You're just going to ruin a relationship by telling them, hey, you're not a disciple. And you're going to offend them and so forth. But if you challenge them from the beginning, hey, seek God with all of your heart, that's when you'll know if someone really loves God or not. Right. And that's what I really appreciate about the Seeking God study. It's like, the Seeking God study really reveals who is really seeking God with all of their hearts or not. Mm. Right. I mean, I love it even just Thomas, like, that's his number one, that's his favorite study, right? We'd be doing discipleship, and he's and he'd be talking about seeking God with all of your heart, bro. <laughs> you'd be doing light and darkness with someone, he's like, bro, that's why I'm telling you, you've got to give God all your heart. I'm like, bro, we're talking about light and darkness. <laughs> um, but it is very helpful because that's what God is all is only looking for. Right. He's not interested in you guys coming to church. I mean, you guys still should, right? That's part of giving God all your heart. Yeah. But God is like, I don't care how many people there are in, in the church or whatsoever. All I care about is people that give me all of their hearts mm -hmm. and all of their souls. Mm -hmm. You know, these false teachers that Peter refers to, he, he goes, you know, they, they'll, they'll be subtle. Meaning, the meaning of the word subtle means they won't really announce themselves, right? So first he, he goes on in verse 1 and he says, these false teachers, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Remember, heresies is just a false doctrine, right? And I love it because he says they will secretly introduce these false doctrines. Mm. I mean, because if you think about it, that's how false teachers work. Right. They don't come in and say, hey, guys, I'm the new pastor. You know, my name is Scotty. I'm a false teacher. Would you like to throw me on church? You know? They don't do that, right? They just don't, like, hey, this is what I believe. This is what you should know. Yeah, that's it. All right? But, it, you know... He goes on in verse 3 and he says, they will also exploit you. Exploit meaning they will use you. Right? They go on and they say, um, in verse 14, which we'll, uh, we will get to later on, it says, these false teachers, they will also seduce the unstable. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why when, after we study the Bible with people and they become disciples, I try to get people to have three follow-up studies within a week. Why? Right? Because the young Christians are usually the unstable ones. When I was in, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, it's, it's the truth. It's because we just came out of the world, mm -hmm. so what, our thinking pattern is just still worldly. Mm -hmm. right. We're just now sort of trying to change it to be God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, if you think you're strong, think again. <laughs> you need to, like all the years, if you think about it, I became a disciple at 21. Right? So for 21 years, I thought um, and spoke and looked the way the world did. Right. And so it'll take about another 21 years for me to really unwind all of that and become like Jesus. Right. And so in the same way, that's why I always encourage people, it's like, man, you've got to get time to have followers. Mm. You've got to get in there, do follow us. One, two, three a week, four a week, that'd be great. Why? Because we don't want people to be dragged away by false doctrine. Mm. Right. You know, it goes on in verse 18 and it talks about these people, they will entice you, right? This word enticing, I've talked about it when I was doing my James series. But it's this idea that it comes from this art of fishing, right? Which is kind of like what Satan does to you most of the day. You know, you, you walk around and he's like, he's like, here, yeah, you know, like, he's just like, I'm cheating the fuck. But like, that's what fishing right? And, and like, he's trying to use his bait and he's like, yeah, I know you want it. You know, I 
Maybe it's money, maybe it's women, maybe, I don't know what it is that people can struggle with, but that's what Satan does. And in the same way, false teachers, a lot of these people, they'll try and entice you through different means. Whether it's the music, whether it's, um, you know, the, the light. Man, I've been to churches that I'm just like, this is my church, this church is pumping, right? Yes. Like the music's pumping, the lights everywhere and so forth. But the Bible talks about that's not how we should be. We should be about attracting people because of the word of God. Right. Mm. Because if people come in by the music, guess what? They'll go out by the music as well. <laughs> right? But if people come in by the word, they'll never go out because the word never goes empty. Amen. 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 And so in the end, they, they also in verse 13, it says they promise freedom. But the crazy thing about that passage is, the most disturbing thing about that passage is when I read it, it's not the fact that false teachers will come. It's the fact that if you look at verse 2, I believe, it says that many will follow them. Right. That's the most disturbing thing about reading that passage. Mm-hmm. It says it, there's not really this false teachers. So false teachers will come. But it's saying that many people will actually follow these people. And here, Peter goes on, man, like many will follow them, be like them, and in the end, they will bring the truth into disrepute. Disrepute meaning they will bring disgrace to the truth or gospel. In Matthew chapter 7, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. The Bible says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. You know, when I was in Sydney, I met so, pe- so many people that were like, yeah, I-, I went to church, I just saw the hypocrisy, and I just left. You know, I just, like, what's the point? And I met so many people that said that. They were like, what's the point of me going to church if the very people that are preaching the church um, are living a double life or living, you know, against what they're preaching? And so many people left church because of that. And even I remember when we were going out to you know raise special missions, special contribution, we would sell cookies, right? I feel almost ashamed to tell people, hey, it's for church missions. Because mm-hmm. in Sydney, people were so disillusioned, so disgusted by the church, they were like, man, like the church is not even impressive. Right. The church yep, yeah. yep, yep, about hey, grace, love, freedom, <clears throat> hey, help in the community and stuff like that. And yet they're the very first ones to commit all the sins they speak against. Right. And there were times where I would tell people about the church and they would look, I don't want to do And so I'd tell people, hey, it's, it's, for, the, it's, for, the, um, it's for the Mercy Project in uh, Cambodia, you know, the, yeah. the orphanage. <laughs> I would use the orphanage. Because I, I felt so ashamed because I was like, I don't know what to say to these people hmm. because that's the truth. Right. You know, the church has become a joke. Hmm. Even in Samoa today, the church is a joke. Hmm. And I pray that our church is not the same as well. Yeah. Are you with me, church? Yeah. yeah. And so... And we see that happening today. So many people are getting confused because the church is meant to help the community. But what we see now is the community is trying to help the church. Mm. The church was called to change the world, but now we see the world is changing the church. Wow. You know, even in Samoa, there was, I mean, not too long ago, there was a minister that was found dead in a car mm. with a woman that was in her, his wife. Mm. You know, there's even cases of ministers raping teen girls, even people professing to be Christians, yet doing exactly the opposite of what the Bible talks about. Right. You know, I even have a friend um, who sadly at one point um, got pregnant out of wedlock, right? At one point, she, she got pregnant and stuff, and so the, the, the minister told her, hey, if you come back to church, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand up in front of the crowd, uh, in front of the church, with your parents and apologize for the sins you've committed. I'm like, why in the Bible does it say that? Mm. It's like, this girl needs help, not mm. condemnation or mm. shame and so forth. It's like, yes, yeah, she's made a mistake, but what about all the people that have sinned themselves as well? Mm. You know? Mm. And so we get to the situation where we become a source of just judgment and joke instead of being the real help that we are called to be to the world. But my main point in all of this is just because a church has many members doesn't mean it's a true church of God. Mm. Now, a true church of God grows, right? Because the Bible says it's supposed to be fruitful. But not every growing church is a true church of God. Because even as we looked at Matthew 7, it talks about only a few will go through this narrow gate. Mm. You know, when I first studied the Bible, right, I was going to a church called Hillsong. And... uh, 
I remember when I first entered, it was I was like, why is not sound on churches like this? <laughs> and the, the lights were just like beaming, the music was like, I can feel the bass like hitting my chest and I'm like, oh boy, I'm just like getting into it. <laughs> and, um, and it was just, it was an amazing experience. I remember my first church service, I was just like, this is my church. This is it. You know, like, this is the church I've been looking for. Right? And then when I came to this church, which was in Sydney, I came because, uh, you know, Joe and Chi, uh, brothers in Sydney, they invited me. And they were like, hey, come to our church. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll come, come. And then, Six weeks or, I don't know, three months later, I, I went to church, right? <laughs> 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 three months later, I went to church. And I went to church. And uh, I remember Cho, Joe, after preaching, he, he had this sort of, like, he was, look, he was, I, I guess he felt like, from what I saw, he felt very proud of his church. He was like, man, the singing, they felt like the singing was incredible. I remember thinking, man, this is, this is not good, <laughs> you know? And I remember Joe came up to me and was like, so what do you think? I was like, Good man. <laughs> <laughs> like, good, you know? like, yeah, and, and he was like, "Why do you think it's good?" And at that moment, I got caught off guard, right? Because I was like, it, in my heart, I was like, "It's not good," but I just said it's good because I didn't want to be mean to him. And he's like, "Why do you think it's good?" And I was like, "Oh, oh well, I mean, um, I loved it when everyone was saying, come on, Joe,' and stuff like that. When people were crazy, and uh, you know, I mean, crazy good, but actually, in my mind, I was like, no, terribly good. Because <laughs> I went to the church, right?" So, mind you, I just came from Hillsong, there was about like 300 people at every church service. So that was a lot, right? right? And then I came to a church that was only 30 people. And I looked around and I'm like, really? And, and like people, there were no instruments, people were just singing and people were like, yeah, come on, come on, you know, and you could hear Jenna, come on, Joe, let's go. Uh, I was like, guys, just calm down, be quiet, you know? And uh, I just sat there and I was just like, oh, this is weird, you know? And, um, it was only, I mean, that's what it really was. And I just got to the point where I was just like, I don't think I want to be a part of this church, right? Um, but it was only when I studied the Bible that I realized, I was like, wow, it really isn't about how great the music is or how great the band is or how talented or how professional people look or, you know, the amount of pretty girls that were in her song because they had a lot of pretty girls and stuff. But I realized, it's like, that's not what God is after. God is after for the few that will really be truthful and not be false teachers. Mm -hmm. And so I made the decision then, it's like, okay, well, this is what the Bible says or says, I'm gonna do it. And so in the same way, guys, I really wanna encourage you, false teachers will come, right? And rather than pointing a finger and thinking, who's gonna be a false teacher in here, right? Because we'll go on to scripture that we'll talk about that later. But it's about the idea that that's why I'm encouraging you guys all the time. It's like, read your scriptures. Right. Now, I was even talking to uh, one of the brothers in, in um, in New Zealand, and uh, I, right after we talked, he said, I want to be baptized, right? I was helping him, he's like, I want to be baptized, and so he got baptized. And after he got baptized, he's like, what do you think, like, what advice do you think you have for me to help me? I was like, bro, just read your scriptures like crazy. Like, seriously, that's the only thing that kept me faithful. That's the only thing that's kept me truthful to this point is, I just read my Bible like crazy. Right. And so the same way, guys, like, we've got to have that, you know, urge and just desire to read our Bibles like crazy. You know, Peter concludes in verse 3, he talks about the fact that, you know, these false teachers that will come, their judgment will be condemned and be destroyed in hell. Point number two, false teachers will go, and they'll go to hell. So we'll continue on in verse 4 to 22. Verse 4 to 22, the Bible says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if, condemned, if, the, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. And you're continuing on, 
This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings, yet even angels, although they were stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid with, back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed group. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness, but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without, uh, beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's manners. These men are springs without water and mist driven by storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while, them, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is slave to whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they are at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a soul that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. A soul meaning a pig. That's what it all that's what basically what it is. But point number two, the false teachers will go to hell. Right? That is an assurance by God. You know, God's description of history in this passage guarantees that false teachers will without a doubt go to hell. Right? And he goes on in verse 4 and he talks about, look, if God didn't even spare the angels, right? The angels who was with God, who was in his presence, who was serving God, who was pleasing God, and yet when they made a mistake and followed Satan, God did not spare them. When they made a mistake in following the wrong way, God just smashed them, smashed them out of heaven and sent them to hell. Mm -hmm. And he goes on and, and uh, you know, he goes on and he, in verse 5 and he talks about, you no, know, even from the beginning of the world, God saw the sinfulness and the wickedness that was going on. And so he wiped the world and destroyed it with the flood. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on again and he goes and talks about the fact that even Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed them so badly that it was so terrible that burning, you know, there was sulfur from heaven, burning sulfur that came and destroyed all the cities. It was so bad that even Lot's wife had to turn back and look, right? And even Lot's wife making that one mistake, God just froze her into, you know, a piece of salt and so forth, and she died at that very point. And then he goes on and it talks about the fact that, you know, if God did these things to these people in the old times, God will surely do it again this time. Right. You know, but all of this... It talks about this idea that, you know, if God destroyed the wicked and saved the righteous from all of these things, God will surely save the righteous this time and destroy the wicked again. Now, like I said before, because sometimes we can feel like, man, when is the wicked going to get the, you know, judgment, right? Sometimes we can feel like that. Sometimes, you know, even when I was um, uh, at McDonald's, right? Um, <laughs> it's funny, because the whole church, they were in McDonald's back and forth the whole day. And as soon as I walked in, I was there for like, I think five seconds, and the security just walked up and said, hey, um, the manager said, um, you know, you're not supposed to be here anymore. Um, no more Bible studies and so forth like yeah. that, and, and uh, you shouldn't be here, and I think you should, you should leave right now. It's like, what about the fact that I buy food when I come in? Like, I mean, I know it's tea, but, <laughs> you know, it's something. <laughs> um, and he's like, no, yeah, sorry, you know, all this stuff. And at that, time, and at that time, I just felt very shameful. I was like, dang. I'm not going to walk out the other way, but the other way was locked, right? So I'm like, man, yeah, I've got to walk through the stuff, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, at that time, the shame was kicking in, and, and, and it was easy for me to feel like, man, you guys will see, you know, God will, God will send software and destroy McDonald's, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that, you know, those thoughts, those thoughts, they just passed my mind. It, I didn't entertain it, but in the end, I just walked down and be like, no, I should be smiling. I am ashamed. 
right? I'm ashamed because they're looking at me and they're probably going, oh, you know, you know, you know, but I remember walking out and smiling and I was just like, yeah, I am ashamed. Oh, I'm ashamed because it's God, right? I'm ashamed for Christ's name, and that's good. You know, because in the end, God will bring shame on those who think they are not shameful in the ways that they're living in right now. Mm-hmm. And so, in the same way, it's like, you know, God will bring that judgment. Because sometimes you can feel like, man, I'm just persevering. You know, my, my family is just persecuting me. My, my parents are persecuting me. My friends are laughing at me. All these different things. It's like, man, I feel like, what am I doing? Like, where are you going? Right? We can feel like that sometimes. Where are you going? Rescue me. Like, you know, all these people are saying these things about me. Well, why won't you come to my house? But God is like, no, just be patient. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, it will come. Amen. And my word, I will never go back on. And then he goes on, and, you know, even the fact that God describes these false teachers, it guarantees that they will go to hell. You know, in verse 10 to 12, this is what I'm talking about. But it talks about, you know, God describes these false teachers. He goes, you know, these guys, they despise authority. Right? They don't even listen to authority. You know, the authority, well, the authority you may be asking, it could be Jesus, it could be a church leader, it could be anyone else, but it's just talking about the fact that, man, these guys don't even, they don't even listen to authority. Um, and it talks about the fact that, you know, they slander celestial beings. Celestial beings, the Greek for celestial beings, it means glories, right? Glories means a reference to authority, whether it's, you know, the angels, whether it's the Christ church leaders, <laughs> Regardless of whatever, it's just a general term for authority, right? That's what celestial beings is talking about. And, it's, and, it, and it goes on and it says, like, even the angels, they don't even slander or say anything terrible to, to the devil who deserves it. Mm-hmm. If you guys turn to Jude chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. Come on, Jude chapter 1. It says, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. Reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare, uh, himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Nice. And he's continuing on and he's like, you know, in the same verse in Second Peter uh, chapter 2, it's talking about, you know, like animals, these guys are like animals. And like animals that are born to be destroyed, so they too will be destroyed. And, um, you know, it, and it goes on later on. It says, like, these people, their minds are unspiritual. They think they're spiritual, but they're actually not. You know, they may preach with passion. They may teach with passion. They may, like, quote several scriptures. But if you look at their lives, they're totally unspiritual. You know, I remember, um, even when I first went to Bible Talk, um, you know, in our church in Sydney, like, I, I, I was just seriously bold and arrogant, thinking, oh, man. I know the scriptures. I remember the boys would ask me, hey, what do you want to study the Bible? I said, bro, I stuck the Bible at home. I'm not worried about it. I got you. You know, I got you. I'll come next week. I'll come next week. You know, and I I came next week. I came the following week and they were like, bro, I studied the Bible. I said, bro, I studied the Bible on my own. Right? But it was only until God really, really tore me apart and and really humbled me in the sin that I was in. Then I was like, I don't know where to go. I still want to go back to the song, but I know that the committed Christians I know are Joe and Chief, so I'm going to run back to them, you know? And it was the same situation where I was exposed of my unspirituality. It's funny, people may seem spiritual, but if you get to really know them deep down, they're actually not. Come on. You know, it talks about the fact that, you know, the delight in sensuality. Um, in verse 13 all the way to 19, it talks about, it says they carouse in broad daylight. The word carouse there, it's just giving this idea of living in luxury. And it goes on and it says, you know, these people, they love sexual immorality and money. The two very common sins in our society today and the two very um, accepted as normal today. Mm-hmm. You know, and then in verse 13, it talks about this idea that the promise, they, they promise freedom, right? I mean, so many churches say that today, right? You go to church and be like, this year is a year of breakthrough for you. God wants to do something incredible for you. This year will be the best in your life, yet you will live the life that you want. And you will be free to do whatever you want. And they go on and on and on. But it's not true. You know, they promise so much freedom. Mm. And yet it's not the freedom of the Bible. Because if you guys turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. This is what freedom is, right? It's Come on, somebody. Come on, skeps. Freedom. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. The Bible says here, right? This is what Jesus says. 
sorry, no, this is wrong. Um, I mean, John chapter 8. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> sorry, I got it wrong then. John chapter 8, sorry. Turn back to John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. This is what the freedom that uh, Jesus talks about. And it says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, like I said, when I was going, I remember I went to Hillsong this one time, right? And uh, I was so deep in sin. And I, and I remember Barak was there with me, <laughs> and a couple of other boys from Fiji, right? Um, so some of our mates in Sydney. And after the, and we borrowed one of our Chinese friends' uh, messed up car, so I was driving on the way to church. And in, in, in church, right, I realized, holy moly, like, I'm, I'm so enslaved by my sin, by pornography, by masturbation, the things that I was struggling with. And I heard the sermon, and I'm like, guys, just... Pray a prayer, raise your hand, you will be set free. The freedom that is in Christ is none other. Right? And I remember standing there, I just raised my hand like that. And that was about the eighth time I raised my hand <laughs> in about like six months, right? And I remember just raising my hand like that. I was closing my eyes because I was a bit ashamed of Beric and my other friends as well that were there. I was like, I want this, like, that's enough. You know? <laughs> and I remember I raised my hand, I got a new Bible, I walked out, right? And I remember feeling good about myself. I was like, ain't nobody gonna touch me now. This boy is free. <laughs> this boy is free. I remember I hopped in the car, right? Me and Barry were like Barry was sitting next to me in the front and my, my mates were at the back, right? Because we were gonna drop them off. So that's why Barry was sitting in the front. And so we we're driving, 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 and then we dropped them off. And I forgot what joke they were saying was. And I remember responding back to them, I was like, bro, nothing you're gonna say is gonna change it, man. I am free! I am saved to, tomorrow if I die, I'm going to heaven, you know, Jesus saved my life, I'm a changed man. The next day I fell into sin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember I, I, I was genuinely sincere. I was genuinely sincere. I was like, this is it. It's over. You know? And I remember feeling so happy to myself. I even like when the car left. Like, I was saying goodbye to my friends, and I remember, whoa, I said that. I was like, screaming, I was like, whoa, yeah, you know, I'm a new person, man. I, was, I remember laughing and just like being so happy, and then the next day I fell into sin, and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> right? But I was promised something that wasn't true. Because here in the Bible, Jesus promises, it's like, no, no, if you obey me, you will be set free. Right. Right? Because churches nowadays, they don't teach you to obey, right? I mean, some, some of them, like, like say it, but they don't come out and teach you to obey. Right. But it was only when I studied the Bible to become a disciple that I realized, holy moly, the freedom I was looking for, Jesus was saying, hey, you're just going to walk according to my word, hold my teachings, and you will be set free. You'll become a disciple, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. And so many people today, it's the same thing where they think they have freedom, but freedom only comes through obedience of God's word. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even sometimes for us today, sometimes we can think that freedom is doing anything we like. No, no, no. Freedom, we've done, we've, I mean, we've lived life, lives in the past where we've been enslaved, right? And in prison and entangled by our own sin. And we just wanted to be free. And then obeying the Bible just suddenly set us free. And so in the same way, this idea of freedom is not doing anything you like. No, freedom comes from obeying Christ. You know, it goes on and it talks about in verse 20 to 22, it's like their destiny is worse than absolute pagans. Pagans mean unbelief. He's like these false people that claim to be Christians or claim to be teachers and are false teachers, they will actually, their judgment and their punishment will be worse than pagans. It's like unbelievers, you think they're going to be bad? Watch me and God is like, watch me and how I deal with these false teachers. I will deal with them. You've just got to stay faithful. You know, um, in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45, it kind of explains, you know, not only, not only will God deal with them harshly, but it also talks about this idea that they'll even be worse than they were before. Mm -hmm. So in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45, the Bible says, When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left when it arrives. It finds a house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes, and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. 
and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Mm. The Bible talks about the fact that, you know, the truth is you can't avoid sin, right? What you can do is you can do something to replace that sin. You know, that's why we have Bible talks on Friday. Why? Because most of you guys, Friday was like a party day, right? And you guys go out and get drunk and so forth. So if we just stop you guys from going, <coughs> guess what you will do? And instead of replacing something, guess what you will do? You'll end up falling back into it. Right. But we've got to replace bad activities with good activities. Yeah. So even on our kingdom dating on Saturday, that's why we go on kingdom dates on Saturday. And I really want to encourage you guys. I don't think our culture here in the church is creating a healthy kingdom dating culture. Mm. Right? Every time we don't take a sister or brother out on a date, Satan is most probably planning a date for them. Mm. Right? I mean, that's the truth. Yeah. He's either using people or he's probably using their own sin, mm. their own weaknesses. And so I really want to encourage you guys. It's like, the, even the Bible talks about this idea that, you know, if we don't have something, if we don't attack it, right? We can't defend against Satan's schemes. We can't. At some, in some instance, you can. But it talks about this. We've got to do things to attack it, replace it, right. so that he don't fall into the same sin. You know, and it talks about this idea that, you know, if someone was knew the truth, experienced the miracles of God, and was there and, and participated in everything, it's like, man, that if they leave that truth, they'll be worse off than where they were before. Um... But continuing on, you know, so many churches today talk about this idea that once saved, always saved. The truth is, once saved doesn't mean no always saved. Right. You can lose your salvation. Mm. You can lose your salvation, and everyone needs to hear that. And that's why I always encourage them. It's like, read your Bible, pray. You know, get encourage one another. Have the time of your lives doing things in brothers' household or sisters' households or even married house will do things so that you don't fall into sin. Why? Because the fight is so hard. Mm. Just standing and trying to defend Satan's schemes, that's like standing to commit suicide. Mm. Sometimes they say, you know, the best defense is the greatest offense. <laughs> Instead of rather than standing and defending, you've got to attack and do things to overcome your sinful nature. You know, I was even talking to Joe, right, um, on the Skype one time, and I was like, Joe, like we were doing D time, he's like, bro, you look really busy. And he's like, you know what? You know me. I've got to keep myself busy. If I don't keep myself busy, I'm definitely falling into sin. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm easily falling into sin if I don't keep myself busy. And that's why we have things like evangelism. That's why we have things like studying the Bible with people, Bible talks, Sunday church. Why? Because if we do nothing, we'll end up sinning our brains out. You know, just a challenge for all of you guys. I really want to encourage you guys. I want you guys to go this week, right? I want you to write down 10 things that you are thankful for to God in revealing you the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is, you know the truth. But you can also leave, leave or also lose that truth. Mm -hmm. But I want you guys to go through your prayers this week and really pray, what are 10 things I could thank God for, for revealing me the truth? For example, I could thank God, you know, thank God for Jenna meeting me, right? Mm -hmm. Thank God for yeah. um, even people <clears throat> studying the Bible with me. I remember when I first discovered the truth, I was like, oh, what the heck? How did we miss it? Mm -hmm. Maybe even thanking God for Bible talks, how great the food was that made me come again, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe thanking God, like sometimes I thank God for, for using, I mean, I'm not proud of it, but God used my sin to bring me to Bible talk. I thank God, you know, I thank you God that Jenna was blonde, that I thought her friends would be brunettes and blondes and, I don't know, all sorts of people from the States uh, in, in Australia. Because I, I, I only went to Bible talk because I thought they were like, you know, like legit Australian girls there. And I got, and I got there, it was only like Chinese, right? Yeah. I mean, not like it's Chinese. <laughs> Chinese are pretty, right? It's just, you know, everyone has their expectations, amen? Yeah. But anyway, man, yeah. maybe think, like, find out what are you thankful for knowing the truth? And then the next thing, I really want you guys to go through and, and thank God for the kingdom. Yeah. Ask yourself, why should you be grateful for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Like, what, should, what could you be doing right now if it weren't for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. You know, if Monica didn't come up and Play your little jokes at you and stuff like that, or I don't know, like do make encourage you, make you laugh and so forth. Like, what would you be doing, right? If they didn't write you a deep card and like really hit your heart and so forth, like how how would you be feeling right now? 
You know, if Patrick didn't get up on that dance floor and like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's go. like just really like light the dance floor up, like would you even want to be a part of a party that without Patrick? You know? I don't know about you guys, but Patrick's like the you know the stage man. So, yeah. But just really thinking through these things, what are things that you are grateful for? Number one, for God revealing you the truth, and number two, for God's kingdom. You know, in conclusion, beware of false teachers. Point number one, false teachers will come. It's not a matter of if, they will. Yeah. Um, but I love Paul's heart to it. If you guys turn your Bible to this is the last scripture. Um, Acts 20, verse 28 to 31. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 31. Okay. It says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of God's people, or the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you, each of you, night and day with tears. How important really is the truth? Well, it's implied there by Paul's heart. It's like every single day and night I've reminded you with tears. Because false teachers will come. And the last thing that I need for any of you guys to do is be that false teacher or be led away by false doctrine. Right? And guys, I really want to encourage you. Read your Bibles. False teachers will come. False teachers are already here. False churches are already present. Read your Bibles. Get to know. Get into Bible studies. Pray a lot. You know, point number two, false teachers will go to hell. The judgment, we leave that to God. All we know is that they will come and they will go to hell. And let's just pray that God saves us in a time when it is right. I love you guys a lot. That's our awesome. <laughs>